This is DigiTalk, the podcast, the show where we talk about how technology is shaping the world and its future. Hello everyone, long time no see and no hear in this format, but here we are again. This is DigiTalk, the podcast, and I am Ivan Zapranov. Today, my guest is going to be one of the main speakers from this year's DigiTalk conference, Mr. Andrew Keane, who is going to join me from far, far away, or in other words, from California. Andrew is an author entrepreneur and the host of the great podcast Keenon. The reason why I'm talking to Andrew today and why I asked him to be the main speaker of this year's DigiTalk is his book How to Fix the Future, which I recommend deeply from to everybody that is listening. With all that aside, hello Andrew. Hello, thank you so much for uh, having me on the show and on the podcast. I usually finish my interviews with these questions, but in your case, and in the context of AI rising, banks failing, war raging, social media bubbling about all that, it seems fitting to start with it. What bothers you about the world today? What what bothers me, uh, I'm not sure if the right word is bothered. Um, I'm interested in the fact that no one seems to be able to figure out how to borrow the language of my book, Fix the Future, including myself. I, I don't think I'm any different from anyone else. So the idea of fixing the future is is very hard because we're not entirely sure what the future is. And um, we, uh, we're struggling to make sense of everything that is breaking around us. Uh, everything is broken, but we're not clear about how uh, to fix it. Um, so the old system is in disrepair, but the new system hasn't really come into being yet. And I'm not even sure whether it's a system or a new world isn't coming into being yet. So we're in the, we're in limbo. We're stuck between two worlds. How do you see the old system failing? And how do you think that if there is a new system, uh, what, what components, components should it have to fix anything like not not everything but what are the the problem pieces today well there are a few biggest problem pieces one is inequality um another is the role of technology which is speeding ahead without any control a third might be a kind of broader crisis of the state uh both in advanced western democracies like the United States and the United Kingdom and many so-called second world countries, perhaps like Bulgaria, Turkey, Greece, uh, Lebanon, uh, Pakistan, uh, states which are falling to pieces, which are in crisis. Um, another piece, I think, is uh, the fact that the old political ideologies don't seem to be relevant anymore. The political ideologies of the left and of the right, uh, particularly of the left, progressive ideologies. Another piece, of course, is the environmental crisis. Um, and uh, a final piece is this broader anxiety that seems to have afflicted many people around the world, particularly younger people, which is certainly bound up with technology. So generally a sense of malaise, of helplessness. And what this is I think encourage both on the left and the right is a nostalgia for an old world. For conservatives, it's the cult of ethnicity or of nationalism. For progressives, it's a cult of the New Deal, a cult of the state of the 20th century state, which probably isn't very viable in the 21st century. Um, and of course, the other crisis, which um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, is the crisis of democracy. Uh, both in advance, and I use that word carefully, advanced, I'm not sure how advanced they actually are, uh, wealthy Western democracies, the United Kingdom, United States in particular, um, but also in uh, countries which are trying to develop democracies. Uh, Hungary is a good model, Poland, Bulgaria also. I will take you on the ideology take and 
uh, what I want to ask at first is, has technology and the speed of information that we have today and we have, I think, about a decade uh, so far, has it broken politics? Yeah, the, the idea of breaking politics, I think, is maybe an exaggeration. I'm not sure politics can be broken. Democracy can be broken. Politics can't be broken because it's always going to exist. Uh, the problem is when it is challenged, it can sometimes degenerate into violence or absence of any kind of discussion or dialogue. It certainly dramatically changed politics. We're seeing over the last 10 or 15 years this crisis of democracy, the cult of authoritarianism from Bolsonaro and Putin to Trump, Erdogan, uh, Orban. Um, but also a new way of doing politics, which has failed. The Arab Spring has failed. People were very, very hopeful that social media would deepen democracy and make it more immediate. It hasn't. What it's done is either created scenarios for civil war in a country like Syria, or enabled the reimposition of a hardline authoritarianism in countries like uh, Egypt, or perhaps in places like Iraq, enabled essentially the reimposition of colonialism. So uh, it, it, in, in, in broad sense, democracy is in decline, in crisis, partly, I think, because of the hopes of social media, which have broadly not been realized. And I think social media has made everybody more impatient with politics, more intolerant, less capable of talking with people who don't agree with them. It's created an echo chamber politics, an echo chamber culture, where we only ever talk to people we agree with uh, on platforms like Twitter or Facebook. So we can't imagine even engaging in discussion with groups of people who are different from us. The, the internet was supposed to make us more open-minded, more global. It's actually localized us and made us extremely intolerant. Not that we were so tolerant in the first place, but I think it's deepened our intolerance. Um, and it's legitimized that intolerance because if, uh, if, if all we see around us are people who agree with us, who look like us, who share our values and views, then it almost seems natural that the world reflects those values and views. And when we come across people who don't share those values and views, they seem unnatural. I myself am very deeply invested in this particular topic about social media, uh, because just like you, I remember when social media was uh, this ray of optimism, ray of sunlight that is going to give everybody a voice and is going to solve all our problems and everybody will have uh, unlimited uh, access to information and so on. I think that this is this has happened. There is an unlimited access to information, but it has not produced the results that you might imagine. Uh, so the, the question here is, can you fight fire with fire? Because all of these technological companies and the governments that are also deeply invested in these problems, they are all turning to even more technology to fix these problems. Well, I think they're a bit confounded. I mean, I think Twitter's in crisis for reasons which most of your listeners and viewers are familiar with. The, the, the cult of Elon Musk, his own cult of his own personality, and Musk himself is a product of this world. Um, Facebook seems to be doing a, a reasonably good job, given that it became the, the, the convenient punch bag for everyone. Um, but I think... Blaming social media is too easy. I think I've been guilty of that in part. I think it's more complicated than simply saying, well, we need to reform social media and the world will be a better place. Social media is a consequence of forces. If, if there is a first mover in this in many ways, I think it's economics and our architecture of what some people might call neoliberalism or a globalized economy, which is compounding inequalities and making it incredibly hard for people to make sense of their own circumstances. Um, Marx always suggested that we become human if we understand our, those circumstances. The globalized world, the neoliberal world, is makes it very hard for us to make sense of why we're rich, and particularly why we're poor and why we struggle. Uh, and I don't think you can blame social media on that. In many ways, so, social media is epiphenomenal. 
Uh, although it is also the cause of some stuff. I mean, it's like a ball of yarn or two balls of yarn which are mixed up together. They're sometimes very hard to unwrap. How did it resonate with you in California, uh, the sudden collapse of Silicon Valley Bank? And I'm asking you this question not only because it is current news, but because I have not been in California. I will start with that. But I have read and I, yeah. uh, I have read quite a lot about uh, what is happening there. Obviously, my half of my sector is there. And also, I know quite a lot of people who work or have lived there or are currently living there. And one of the things that they always say that they cannot just get up with it is the fact that they are really rich. And then you go on the street and there are thousands of homeless people. Yeah, I mean, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank hasn't made any difference to the armies of homeless people on the streets of San Francisco where I live. And it's not making entrepreneurs into homeless people. They've been made whole by the government. So I'm not sure that the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank is either here nor there when it comes to the radical inequalities in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco and San Jose on the San Francisco Peninsula. But it is striking what you talk about. Um, it is an astonishing place, San Francisco. It's both the future and the past. Um, it's a warning about uh, a, a, a future which is, the only words I can really think of are neo-feudal. The, the geography of San Francisco is a small town, so I don't know what the, the, the exact measurements are, but it's a, a few miles. It's a, it's a narrow little peninsula within a peninsula. Uh, on the San Francisco Bay at the entrance of the Pacific Ocean. Um, so physically, it's a small place. But there are two worlds in San Francisco, two worlds which have absolutely nothing to do with one another. There's the world of homelessness and radical poverty on the streets in particular when you go downtown. There are armies of people living on the streets. And then there's the world of prosperity of people like myself living in nice houses, living well, traveling, going to the airport, going to the theater, shopping. And those worlds have nothing to do with one another. Uh, I have as much in common with the people living on the streets of San Francisco as I do with people living in Sofia in, in Bulgaria. So what you're seeing, I think, in San Francisco is the death of geography in, in the modern age, in the 19th and 20th century in particular. And the great theorist of, of nationalism, uh, Ernest Gellner, has written brilliantly about this. Uh, identity, politics, and geography all came together with the modern nation state. Um, but today in San Francisco, those things have become unraveled. I have nothing to do with those people. They don't vote. They have no sense of identity. I never speak to them. Um, and I have much more in common with you or tech entrepreneurs in Berlin or Bucharest or Budapest or Bengal or, 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 or Bangalore than I do with the, the, the homeless of San Francisco. They don't vote. And you're seeing the unraveling anyway of American democracy. You have a dysfunctionality, not just of the American state in Washington, D.C., but also in San Francisco. Everyone in San Francisco has said, ever since I've lived here, we have to deal with the uh, homeless problem. We have to get people off the streets. We have to address this. We're a rich town. We're full of smart people. And all those things are true, and they've never managed to do it. And the problem only gets worse and worse and worse. So you have a crisis of local government, a crisis of federal government. But the biggest crisis of all, I don't know whether it's a crisis or just a reality, is you have um, people living, human beings living in the same geographical space um, who, who are entirely alien and foreign to one another, um, who metaphorically at least speak different languages. And the only social system which I can use to describe this in historical terms is feudalism, where lords and peasants lived entirely different lives. 
But in the feudal system, there were symbolic connections between the aristocracy and the peasantry. In San Francisco, there's no connection in any way between the people living on the streets and the wealthy upper middle class professionals and tech entrepreneurs living in San Francisco. So it's a fascinating place. Uh, and it's a warning about the future, I think, in the rest of the world. But San Francisco is always ahead. I asked you about Silicon Valley Bank because I think it's a stark symbol of power, actually, because it collapsed overnight and it was pretty much bailed out, even, even though they, they're not going to call it a bailout, also overnight. And uh, what, what this is symbol for me is that some people can make things happen because of money, because of power, because of mm. anything that is a symbol of power. In this case, it is the venture capital funds and the entrepreneurs from Silicon Valley. But then again, if you had this power or even a greater power and you could do something about this uh, this, this disrup disruption of society, what, what would it be? You mean in terms of Silicon Valley Bank or the situation in San Francisco? The economical situation, not only in San Francisco, but anywhere that people, as you say, live in the same place, but they do not live the same life. Yeah, I mean, that's a hard question to answer. Um, you know, when it comes to San Francisco, let's say something a little bit more specific. I think you need the reestablishment of order. Um, you need, uh, and, and one of the astonishing things about San Francisco is essentially the police have retreated. That doesn't make it anarchic and it doesn't even make it that dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of street, petty street crime, people breaking into cars. But what you need is the rebuilding of public space, the respect for public space, the rebuilding of government, the authority of government goes with taxation. And then, and once you've done that, once you've built a foundation, then uh, a, a more aggressive attempt to address this huge problem of homelessness, what to do with these homeless people, why they're homeless. A lot of it is bound up with simultaneous crises of uh, addiction and mental illness. So all this stuff comes together, but these are broader American problems as well. They're bound up with the dysfunctionality of the American healthcare system um, and the absence increasingly of any kind of political authority. So you need a, a, a foundational change. It may be easy to talk about revolution. Oh, well, take the money away from the rich, redistribute it, build homes for the homeless. I'm not sure that that's a particularly, I mean, I guess it's possible, but I'm not sure whether that is the most, um, the most sensible fix for anyone. Is in previous moments of history, you would assume that the people living on the street would rebel, they would riot. They did it in Paris at the end of the 18th century. They did it in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century. They did it in China. They've done it all over the world. But these people aren't angry. They're living in their tent cities. They're not rebellious. So the old idea of rebellion, of political rebellion, of seizing power doesn't exist in America. It doesn't exist in San Francisco. And the oddest thing of all is that often the people with power, the wealthy, are liberals. And they always find other convenient scapegoats, Donald Trump or some local politician. So no one's really willing to take accountability, responsibility. And partly it's such an easy system to just be outraged with and go on with one's life because nothing ever changes. In your book, How to Fix the Future, you take a lot of problems and you cut them into chapters and then you give uh, good examples of uh, the various countries in the world who have uh, done their homework on a particular question or a good company or, or a good government or whatever. Is it still 
possible or has it ever been possible to just take these problems one by one by one or is it as the oscar award winner from uh from two days ago everything everywhere all at once and nothing is really fixable without breaking something else well i'm pleased that um you know i wrote that book i think in about 2017 or 18 certainly before covid before uh the world everywhere at once in one moment changed i think some of the stuff i ch- talked about now is becoming real the the labor the uprising of the precariat the, the techno precariat the uber drivers the airbnb renters people working in this temporary precarious economy are beginning to unionize um i I, would, I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the need for regulation. Uh, when I wrote the book, no one was talking about regulation in the United States. There was a lot of regulatory talk in Europe. That's beginning to happen now. I'm not sure it's entirely successful in the US. Uh, I addressed Section 230, for example, in the book, which a couple of weeks ago in Washington, D.C., there was a Supreme Court hearing about it. We still haven't heard the decision. Um, so a, lo- a lot of the issues that I address are being um, discussed now. I do think that they have to be taken on a uh, an individual by individual basis because there's not going to be any structural revolution. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind is that politics works slowly and technology works fast. When I wrote How to Fix the Future, I'd never heard of chat GPT. Nobody had. Uh, open AI, I may have talked about in the book, but it was still a very early stage company. Today, it's the most interesting and important and powerful and perhaps dangerous company in Silicon Valley. So things move really fast with tech. And as soon as you think you can slow everything down and change everything through politics or the, through the state, you lose. And, you know, even the European effort, I'm not sure, has been entirely successful. Some of the things that have been accomplished, I think, are impressive. But some of the regulation um, doesn't seem to have worked. The right to be forgotten, for example, seems to have benefited the powerful companies able to hire um high price lawyers, whereas small companies haven't worked out. I think the issue that I address in How to Fix the Future, the meta issue, is human agency. And that's, if anything, a more important issue today than it even was back in 2017 and 18. Uh, the, the, the foundation of the book deals with this issue of agency. Uh, talk a lot about uh, uh, Moore's utopia and his idea of agency in the book as the foundation for agency in the future. And of course, with chat GPT and this imminent revolution of AI, having created smart machines that can talk back to us and perhaps in some ways talk better than we can talk, uh, the issue of human agency, if anything, is even more important and pressing and dramatic in 2023 than it was in 2018. I wonder, are you more optimistic, more pessimistic? Has your worldview changed in any way since you wrote the book? Um, I would say I'm more realistic. Um, I'm neither pessimistic nor optimistic. Uh, I've certainly, I was, the book is my fourth book. It came on top of three books, which were quite critical of Silicon Valley. Uh, Cult of the Amateur, which was the first serious critique of Web 2.0. Uh, Digital Vertigo, which was, I think, probably the first serious critique of social media and the problems with social media, particularly the disappearance of privacy and the rise of companies like Facebook. And then the Internet is not the answer, which was a broader critique of the digital economy. Um, so the internet is not the, so how to fix the future was an attempt to, uh, use that critique as a foundation for fixing the problems that Silicon Valley had caused. I was pretty early with all this stuff. Today, what I wrote in Cult of the Amateur and how to fix, uh, and, and the internet's not the answer 
and digital vertigo, everyone's saying the same thing. So I try to keep ahead of everyone else. So maintaining that slightly apocalyptic uh, tone, I think, is inappropriate. It's also not very wise for a writer, speaker like myself, because I just sound like everyone else. And the only reason that I get hired to speak at conferences like yours or have interviews with guys like you is if I'm saying something slightly different. So I've tried to keep ahead a little bit of, um, of, of, of the mob, of the crowd. Uh, I, it would be too easy for me, having been a techno skeptic, to become a techno optimist when everyone else has become techno skeptics and pessimists. And, and, I, and I think that would be uh, too simplistic and, and, and make me look slightly ludicrous. I, I, I think, in overall terms, I see, and, and I know this is going to sound awfully cliched and boring. But I see the good and the bad. I mean, it's an exciting time now to be in Silicon Valley. I think this chat GPT stuff, uh, generative AI is the most interesting thing, certainly since the birth of social media, if not since the birth of the internet. There's enormous potential and enormous dangers with it. And I'm very excited with the potential and very nervous about the dangers. When I was writing my book, also, it's important to note that when I was writing my book, the big tech companies did seem, if not evil, to be very dangerous. The Googles, the Amazons, the Apples of the world, particularly Google and Amazon. I think something's changed over the last, say, four or five or even 10 years. Firstly, they're not quite as scary. Their leadership has changed. They're increasingly in the crosshairs of regulators. They're, if not in retreat, certainly not able to move ahead as quickly or as aggressively as they have historically. But also over the last eight or 10 years, new forces have come about, which puts their threat in context. So Putin's war in Ukraine, the rise of Trump, the crisis of democracy broadly. These are issues which I think put companies like Google and Amazon in context. You know, Jeff Bezos is certainly not an ideal figure, uh, but he owns the Washington Post, which I think is a very good newspaper. Google is not an ideal company, but my wife works at Google and the people who work there are generally good people who want the best for the world. So uh, I think I, I've partly changed my mind about how quote unquote evil these tech companies are. And secondly, we see the rise of, of evil in the world, whether it's Putin's behavior in Ukraine or, or, or the rise of some of this uh, increasingly uh, overtly authoritarian, racist political organizations and parties around the world. And, and that puts into context the threat of companies like Google and Amazon. And we started with what it is that bothers you. And it's only fitting that we end with the question, which is, what are you optimistic about? I'm optimistic. And, and I, a lot of this optimism, I think, comes from conversations I have on my Keen On show. I hope that people who listen to this will have an opportunity to sub subscribe to, to Keen On. I'm optimistic about new technology, which I think can begin to address global warming. I'm not as, I'm not an expert on global warming, but I do, do, do have a lot of conversations. And my sense is that finally there is technology that will allow us to address it. Now we need the political will and we need the investment, but I think technology can do good on that front. I'm optimistic, um, that if chat GPT is used correctly, it can be an enormously valuable resource for creative people like myself um, who work fast and hard and could do with help and can't always afford teams of people to work for them. I'm optimistic that the new media platforms are enabling creatives like myself to escape um, the old media companies that generally aren't very helpful, whether they're newspapers or publishing houses, 
So my podcast uh, is enabling me to build a new business through its RSS feed. I'm optimistic that new platforms like Substack are actually helpful for creative people. Um, so there, there are reasons to be optimistic. I'm optimistic that we're able to have this um, conversation. I'm optimistic that I'm going to be able to come to Bulgaria in May. I'm looking forward to that. I'm optimistic that you and I and our listeners survived uh, COVID. Some people, of course, died. It was tragic for many people, but for most of us, it was an opportunity to recharge our batteries and get back to the real world. So there's lots of reasons to be optimistic. Thank you very much, Andrew. I can't wait to have you here in Sofia and talk in front of the audience, take their questions and hear all about you want to see. I think that it will be a great time to hear about more more about your views on uh, ChatGPT and Generative AI, which I will, uh, I will leave for the conference. Thank you very much again and see you soon. Thank you so much. <laughs>